Hello everyone. So for now, we will be discussing protein metabolism. So this is chapter 26 of your Stephen Stoker book. Um, this is the seventh edition Stoker book. And um, uh, you can also use Seeger or Bettelheim as a reference for this one. If you are having a hard time understanding this topic, you can read your book. So let's start. Protein digestion doesn't start with your mouth, just like your carbohydrate. It starts in your stomach. So the dietary protein presence in the stomach stimulates the release of uh, your enzyme, gastrin. So gastrin pr promotes secretion of your pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid. No? That makes your stomach even more acidic. Hydrochloric acid in the stomach has three functions. First is it is an antiseptic uh, properties that kills most bacteria. It says most because not all bacteria are being killed in your stomach. No, there are actually some bacteria like Helicobacter pylori that thrives in your stomach, but it is one is an, a pathogenic bacteria. We have the denaturing action that unwinds the globular properties of your proteins. We have the acidic properties uh, that leads to pri uh, activation of your pepsinogen. So I would like you to first um, watch the video of protein metabolism or, or protein introduction before you dive into this protein um, metabolism so that you can understand uh, the different um, types of proteins, no? the globular and the fibrous, the um, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and the quaternary form of your proteins. And we have your pepsin. No? These are the enzymes actually that is produced or triggered whenever there's a protein digest uh, being digested in the body. So pepsin, together with your hydrochloric acid, affects the hydrolysis of 10% pep peptide bonds. Okay. The production of secretin is also stimulated by the passage of small amount of acidic protein contents into a small intestine. So this secretin, it stimulates the bicarbonate production, which in turn helps neutralize no, because bicarbonate is um, basic. No? It helps neutralize acidified gastric content. So it promotes secretion of pancreatic digestive enzymes, which are a bit basic no, in comparison with the acidic nature of your stomach. These enzymes are trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase um, in their inactive forms. Okay, so we have this proteolytic, proteolytic enzyme. We have enzymes that attacks peptide bonds. We have pepsin, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and the zymogens or the inactive forms of enzymes, which are proteolytic enzyme produced in an inactive forms. Okay, so um, we have protein digestion and absorption. So um, after the protein is digested, it will become amino acid. It's simplest form, no? It's liberated and transported into the bloodstream via active transport processes. So the passage of polypeptides and small protein across the intestinal wall is uncommon in adults. So in infants, the transport of polypeptides allows the passage of proteins such as antibodies into colostrum milk from a mother to a nursing infant to build up immunologic protection in an infant. So digestion in proteins in humans um, in the mouth no, wala ang ating protein. They are not digested in the mouth. Instead, carbohydrate is the first one to be digested in the mouth. No, um, it starts in the stomach. Um, in the stomach, there's a chemical reaction already using um, hydrochloric acid and your pepsin. No, in stomach, our lipids in comparison doesn't have a chemical reaction. Instead, uh, just physical emulsification of your huge globules into a smaller one. But in proteins, there are already a chemical that is being involved, which is hydrochloric acid and your pepsin, okay? So hydrochloric acid denatures the protein, pepsin hydrolyzes the peptide bond. So it would become large polypeptides, no? These large polypeptides uh, will undergo or proceed into our small intestine and they are further hydrolyzed by the following enzymes. So these are a bit basic enzymes, no? Um, 
Again, the main, the main one that neutralizes the acidity from the stomach is your bicarbonate. So we have trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, and also your amino peptidase. Now, from its name, amino peptidase, these huge peptides no, or polypeptides are being converted or hydrolyzed into a smaller molecule we know as your simplest form of protein, which is your amino acid. Now, this amino acid, through active transports, no, will will be will proceed to intestinal lining, and in this intestinal lining, an amino acids in the bloodstream will be transported. Okay, so to answer for this one, protein digestion begins in the stomach and is completed in the small intestine, resulting in the release of your amino acids. So the correct answer is letter C. Now, in our amino acid pool, Amino acid formed through digestion process enter the amino acid pool in the body. So these are the total supply of all your free amino acids available for use in the human body. So what are the sources of this amino acid pool? We have the dietary protein, protein turnover, in which these are the repetitive process in which proteins are degraded and resynthesized. So this turnover, protein turnover, these are the proteins that are recycled from some functions needed in the body. So say, for example, um, in the degradation of our red blood cells, now, there are protein or a structural protein in our red blood cells. And whenever they are degraded, no, the protein part of this red blood cell are being utilized again by our body to the next function where it will be needed. No? Biosynthesis of amino acid in the liver also is um, uh, another source for our amino acid pool. So only non-essential amino acid are synthesized in the liver. Okay, then the essentials one, the essential one are. Uh, from our dietary protein. So nitrogen balance, since our uh, protein contains a nitrogen group and a carboxylic group, the carboxylic group is easy to synthesize since it contains carbon and oxygen and hydrogen, which is mostly um, the molecules that are needed in the body. But the nitrogen, no? The nitrogen has to be balanced inside our body. And the state that results when the amount of nitrogen taken in the human body as protein equals the amount of the nitrogen excreted from the body in waste material. So there are two types of nitrogen imbalances. The first one is the negative nitrogen imbalance. These are the protein degradation that exceeds protein synthesis. So uh, the amount of nitrogen in urine exceeds the consumed amount results in tissue wasting. So this means the nitrogen that is being removed in your body is too much. No? So it results into a negative nitrogen imbalance. When we have positive nitrogen imbalance, this is the rate of protein synthesis is more than no, the protein degradation. So it, this means that the protein that is being uh, produce or the protein intake is greater than the one that is being degraded. So this is indicated by the synthesis of large amounts of tissue. Okay, so this can be maaaring nagpapabulk yung tao, mapalaki ng muscle, no? They are taking a huge amount of uh, protein-rich foods, no? So, um, nagde-deposit sa tissue. So, yun yun, nagkakaroon ng bulking of your muscles. So, there are uses of, uses of amino acid in the human body. Okay? First is this uh, protein synthesis. It uses 75% of free amino acid. So, that's 75% of your amino acid pool. Now, we have synthesis of non-protein nitrogen-containing compounds. So, these are the purine and pyrimidines. If you can remember this one, this is a part of your DNAs. No? So, we also have your synthesis of your heme for hemoglobin. As I have said a while ago, sometimes um, this process or protein turnover, uh, this, heme of, sorry, this heme for hemoglobin can be an example of a protein um, turnover because uh, if you can remember our red blood cell, um, can only stay in our blood in our in our stream no in our in our body for 120 days so after that they are being degraded and sequestered by our spleen so uh, after they are degraded no there's a lot of process on that that involves the liver and other parts of our body but um the protein part no, is being turned over for other bodily use that's why the uh, upon synthesis of another set of your red blood cell 
um, some amino acid from the pool might be needed to create a heme for hemoglobin which is needed for a red blood cell to uh, thrive in our body. Synthesis of non-essential amino acid, this is in your liver, and of course, production of your energy. Okay, uh, as I've said, and as we reviewed from lipid, I've shown you a structure there in which your protein can undergo gluconeogenesis in which it can produce energy in our body. Okay, so let's proceed on uh, since uh, according to this, each amino acid has a unique degradation pathway. So the degradation pathway, the amino nitrogen atom is removed and excreted from the body as urea. So the degradation of your amino acid in the process or in the form of urea is known as your blood urea nitrogen or BUN. So actually, BUN, again, is a measurable um, compound that is used to measure the functionality of your kidney. So it is um, measured or um, um, used in the hospital with um, creatinine together with your another compound in the body we call creatinine so bun crea is a very important functional uh, me, me, function me, compound that can uh, measure the function of our body sorry about that so the remaining carbon skeleton is converted to pyruvate acetyl coa or citric acid cycle intermediate so here is that amino acid degradation what happens after is we have the carbon portion or this is the cooh portion or terminal of an amino acid and we have the nitrogen portion or the amino group of an amino acid this carbon portion can undergo triacylglycerol via fatty acid it can be used in glucose gluconeogenesis, ATP via citric acid cycle, and ketone bodies via ketogenesis. As I said a while ago, carbon can look for um, functions all over our body. It's easy to look for uh, the utilization of this carbon portion. But the nitrogen, no, they should be eliminated via urea because too much nitrogen in the body can cause um, poisoning so um, or accumulation of ammonia or other nitrogen elements no or um the, the next one is biosynthesis of non-essential and other are the non-protein nitrogen containing compounds okay so this is a question you can pause this video to watch for uh, to answer this question okay the answer is amino acid pool okay we have this transamination and oxidative deamination. So we have degradation of an amino acid takes place in two stages. Remember this? We have removal of alpha amino group and degradation of the remaining carbon skeleton. So the removal of amino group requires transamination. So this one is a process or a biochemical reaction characterized by the interchange of amino group in an alpha amino acid with a keto group in, in, in an alpha keto acid. So this is oxidative um, deamination. Okay, so glutamate production via transamination. So um, this, uh, this reaction, you will get familiarized with this amino transferase process in your clinical chemistry because we will be measuring your ALT and um, your SGPT and SGOT. No, on your um, clinical chem, though we'll not discuss that right now. This uh, is just showing that there's a process we call transamination. And here are the molecules that might be involved in our body on this process. So we have um, alpha ketoglutarate, which can be converted into a glutamate. And on an amino transferase, using amino transferase enzyme, this amino acid byproduct can become keto acid. So that means your alpha ketoglutarate when they are um when they are transaminated, no, they can produce an amino acid, no. Um and um this glutamate can produce alpha keto alpha keto acid. So um you'll notice that we have aspartate. Uh, production this occurs when glutamate is the reacting acid and oxaloacetate is the reacting keto acid okay let's go back right here i think i have discussed this uh confusingly so um on here glutamate production via this is uh via transamination we have uh, glutamate is produced 
glutamate is produced through the transamination when alpha ketoglutarate is the amino group acceptor. Okay. Okay, so if you'll notice, we have the CO double bond group here. So a keto glutarate here is the amino group acceptor from your glutamate. So the amino part in here will be transferred to your alpha ketoglutarate. In return, it would become an amino acid, alpha amino acid. And the CO group or the carboxyl group will be transferred to your glutamate. And in return, it would become in an alpha keto acid. On this part, this occurs when glutamate is the reacting acid. Okay, the reacting acid is glutamate and oxaloacetate is the reacting keto acid. So, um, the main product would become aspartate and alpha-ketoglutarate. Okay, so, these are some transamination oxidative deamination also. Uh, first, we have the alanine. Okay, this alanine, as you may know, is an amino acid combined with pyridoxal phosphate. It would produce a pyruvate and pyridoxamine phosphate. On our step 2, an alpha-ketoglutarate reactant 2 combined with um, pyridoxamine phosphate from here, like this one, this purple one, um, it would produce glutamate and pyridoxal phosphate. So, the ammonium production via oxidative deamination is a biochemical reaction in which alpha amino acid is converted to alpha keto acid with release of an ammonium ion. So, it occurs in mitochondria of the liver and kidney. So, remember that liver and kidney are the first pass, uh, liver is the first pass, but they both have filtering processes. No? And um, on here, glutamate, no? Combined with NAD and your water through your enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase might form your ammonium. Ammonium compound and alpha-ketoglutarate. And ammonium should be removed in our body. Okay, so these are other processes using 4-carbon diacid and 5-carbon diacid. So these are some practice exercises also. Okay, next we have the urea cycle. So urea cycle is the, the effect of transamination, deamination, reaction in the production of ammonium ion and aspartate. So urea cycle is a series of biochemical reaction in which urea is produced into ammonium ions and aspartate as a nitrogen source. So urea produced in the liver is transported via blood to the kidneys and eliminated in the body in urine. So that's why the amount of urea can be used to assess if your kidneys no, is functioning well. Urea is an odorless white solid with a salty taste and has a melting point of 133 degrees Celsius and is soluble in water. So next we have carbamoyl phosphate. One of the one of the sources of fuels of urea cycle is a carbamoyl phosphate. Okay, hold on. Two ATP molecules are expended in the formation of carbamoyl phosphate molecules. So it contains a higher energy phosphate bond and is formed in the mitochondrial matrix. So here's the step of our urea cycle. Okay, I think there's a better um there's a better diagram for this one. Hold on. Let me check. Okay, so here's a better diagram for our carbamoyl phosphate to urea. So, okay, so on this one, it started with um, ornithine transcarbamoyl or ornithine, no? Sorry, this started with carbamoyl phosphate. This carbamoyl phosphate, um, with the use of ornithine transcarbamoylase, no, it would produce or it would... Um, it would uh, provide a phosphate. So this carbamoyl will become citrulline. This citrulline entering the cytosol through our transport system would be condensed to arginine succinate through our enzyme or through our amino acid aspartate and an energy or ATP. So it would be converted, the ATP, into AMP and it will share its part on our two phosphate group. Okay, this arginosuccinate would be then cleave with an enzyme arginosuccinate lyase. Okay, uh, it would produce a fumarate on this uh, process, but the main product of arginosuccinate, as in its cleavage, will form arginine. This arginine will be uh, would be added with 
high, uh, water in the process of hydrolysis with the enzyme arginase, and then it will become urea. This urea will be excreted from our body through our urine, and this arginine will be converted into ornithine. Ornithine will then enter again the mitochondrial matrix from your cytosol and will proceed again to this whole cycle. Okay, so that's your urea cycle. Okay, these are questions again. And amino acid carbon skeleton. Transamination and oxidative deamination removes the amino group from amino acid. So each of the 20 amino acids undergoes a different degradation process. These are nice to know. Okay. These are the summary of our non-essential amino acid also. Okay, so we're going to discuss hemoglobin catabolism. So this is very essential. Uh, we have the red blood cell. So red blood cell are highly specialized cell whose main function, of course, is to deliver and remove carbon dioxide from our tissue. So mature red cells have no nucleus or DNA. So they're filled with hemoglobin. If you can see, they have a central pallor or an indention in the middle. Okay, but some red blood cell you might see under the microscope might have a nucleus. They are immature or uh, what we call reticulocytes. No, they are is they are um, red blood cell that are not yet matured but are released in our blood uh, because there's a dire need of oxygen. So there you might be the person might be at a high places with very low oxygen level. So the body tries to compensate for the deliverance of oxygen in the body. So there's also a lot of pat pathogenic um, uh, diseases no, uh, for the release, early release of your red blood cell in the form of reticulocytes. So um, sometimes as a medical technologist, we count reticulocyte no, and we report that to our doctor. But of course, most of the time we count uh, reticulocyte in the supervision or in an approval of a hematologist. No? Um, red blood cells are formed in the bone marrow. We know that. Approximately 200 billion new red blood cells are formed daily. And the lifespan of red blood cell is 4 months or 120 days. Um, hemoglobin is conjugated protein with two components. No? Heme, from its name, hemoglobin. Heme and globin. The globin is the protein portion and the heme is the prosthetic group. So iron uh, pres present in heme interacts with oxygen. So this is a reversible complex uh, form. Old RBCs are broken down and sequestered by our spleen. On the degradation of hemoglobin, the globin protein part is reconverted into an amino acid and um, become became a part of the amino acid pool, which will then be reused again for other function. The iron atoms become ferritin, no? a storage of iron, which is in a form of also a protein. The tetrapyrrole carbon arrangement of heme is degraded into bile pigment. This bile pigment will be um, deposited in the liver until it goes to our intestines and it gives the color for our feces and urine, which is the yellow color. Okay, bile pigments, they are colored tetrapyrrol degradation product and they are present in bile. So there are different types of bile pigment. We have the biliverdine, the green color, the bilirubin, the reddish orange, the stercobilin, which is usually the ones that give color to our um, fecal or uh, fecal matter, which is brownish in color. We have urobilin, no, which is yellow in color that gives color to our urine. Now, bile pigments, uh, the daily normal excretion of bile pigment is 1 to 2 milligrams in urine and 250 to 350 in our faces. Now, we have this um, term called jaundice in which um, there's an imbalance between formation of the removal of bilirubin. It gives the skin and the sclera or the white part of the eye the characteristic of yellow tint of the illnesses. So usually the people with jaundice has some problem in metabolism, especially on the function of their liver. Okay, so this is a question that you can answer. You can pause this video. Okay. So biodegradation of your cysteine occurs in two steps. You know? um, a transamination reaction and the release of your sulfide sulfidyl group will be reused in our body. We have the cysteine and uh, being transaminated into beta mercap to pyruvate, and then it will then be formed into pyruvate, in which this can be used in creation of 
ATP in our body. So we also have the biosynthesis of cysteine. Uh, serine is the precursor of our cysteine. No? Uh, serine is converted to cysteine in two steps. So we have serine, O, acetylserine, and your cysteine. Okay. Okay, so hydrogen sulfide as a biochemical signaling agent. So it regulates the vascular blood flow and blood pressure. It also influences the brain function and also influences the insulin level in type 1 diabetes. So these are questions that you may answer also. Correct answer for this one is hydrogen sulfide. Okay, so the metabolic pathway of carbohydrate, lipids, and proteins are integrally linked to one another. As I've shown on the diagram, I've shown on lipids at the end of it. So um, an example is feasting, overeating. It causes the body to store limited amount of glycogen and the rest as fat. We have fasting, food is not ingested, and starvation, which is a prolonged fasting. The body protein is broken down to amino acid to synthesize for glucose, in which sometimes it's, it is yung ating mga muscles. No? Kaya lumiliit ang muscles kapag tayo ay nag-starve. Nag -starve. So during starvation, this is a question. You can pause this video. Okay. The correct answer for this one is both A and B. So B vitamins, of course, also participates in protein metabolism. That's why it's important that you take your vitamin B no, and support your body metabolism. So vitamin B participate in various pathways of our protein metabolism also. And mainly, these are the niacin and your PLP. So this is the involvement of your B vitamins in our proteins. Okay, these are some questions. You can post this before you uh, click your next or click uh, quickly. Okay, so that's it for our protein. I hope I hope you've learned something from this discussion. Again, thank you. Please watch the other discussion, lipids and also carbohydrates. Thank you.